Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. We are with Dr. Lamb. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, Dr. Lamb. Um, let's see, today's topic is a little different. I like it. We are going to talk about the birds that we haven't really talked about much before. The little passerines, right? Uh, we're going to do finches and canaries and um, all the little guys. Uh, I cannot wait because I can already see, I see you have some guests with you, some special guests. Um, Yes, uh, I have two special guests with me. They're my two female uh, zebra finches. They'll probably be popping up and down here. They they do come out. I don't know if they're going to come out here because it's a different place. And this isn't their regular cage. This is just like a little travel cage for them. They have like a flight cage at home and they'll occasionally come out of that. Um, so I, I opened the doors and they have the tree stand if they want to get onto it, uh, but I don't know if they actually will. So, but they'll be, they'll be hopping around in the back right now. They're, uh, looks like they're eating a little bit of a snack on the bottom of their cage. All right. Okay. Um, oh, and so, so we've met these, your two, your two little feather friends. Um, and, uh, wanted to, to, uh, well, okay. So we've seen Royal, we've seen, uh, a Royal, uh, your Amazon, we've seen Maureen, your gray. And, um. We've seen videos of Arroyo, especially uh, enjoying his birthday cake and all that, his avocado cake, birthday cake. Um, and then, uh, so now there is, <laughs> there's another one of your feathered family members who's uh, who's who's kind of taken over uh, the the um, the internet, so to speak, uh, and that's your chicken. <laughs> so, <laughs> so My chicken Artemis is uh, the the up and coming bird. <laughs> okay, and the, so the up up a camera trying to take Arroyo's Arroyo's. Uh, Heat over here. He's trying to take just right. Uh, yeah, trying to um, take all the fire. <laughs> all like right. So, so I wanted it. So I don't know if anyone knows this yet, but um, but La Fever has a has a really cool product that just recently came out, and um, and that is da 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 booster berries, and that is for chickens. So um, I just curious if anyone um who's joining us today has a chicken, um, put it in the chat. Just want to see how many chicken chicken people we have out there with uh with some some pet uh pet chickens um, uh and in we got a video to the show of um, Artemis. I love the name, by the way. <laughs> so let's see if we could uh, get that playing. Um, and the name Booster Berries, I love it. it. There we go. Thank you, Brenda. There, Artemis, right? Artemis? I love it. Artemis. She's my chicken who is turning eight this month. So by many accounts, she would be considered a senior. You can see right now that she is having fun looking at those booster berries that are inside of that package. What's great about this particular supplement is it has several things that can help support older hens. It's got black soldier fly larvae that can be helpful with protein. It's got echinacea root, which supports the immune system. It has lemon balm, which is full of some anti antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, and has important vitamins like vitamin A and C. Ginger is also present in the booster berries, which also help as an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Also has glucosamine and chondritin for joint support. And then dandelion leaf, which is helpful for the liver and also has some important vitamins like vitamin C, vitamin K, and vitamin A. Milk thistle is also present in this, along with L-carnitine, which helps burn fat, and red millet, which is a great source of protein and fiber. Meet Artemis. She's okay. my chicken. Who? There we go. That's Artemis, and that's the booster berries. So let's see. Does anyone have chickens here? Um, or if you're gonna visit a farm, my gosh, can you imagine if you just tagged, brought all the bag along of booster berries, you'd be like so popular. Um, so, all right, there we go. Um, that's that is really fun. And that's a, is that it, how how old can chickens live? Sorry, uh, Artemis is nine. Uh, Artemis is eight, so she just Perfect. turned eight in March. Um, yeah. The oldest chicken I've ever met was 13, um, but that's very uncommon. Unfortunately, we do see a lot of chickens that only live to be like three or four. They, they get a lot of reproductive answers. Unfortunately, it's really common in the chicken. Um, so there's a lot that don't live very long lives, unfortunately. Uh, but Artemis is eight. She's doing well. She developed a cataract like three months ago or so to show her age but she's showing it with grace she's Aww. uh you know still very active chicken um certainly doesn't act her age at all yeah and i imagine a great ground forager <laughs> so yeah. Can do, right? yeah very good ground forager <laughs> okay uh well well thank you for uh letting us meet her or right. yeah um let's uh let's let's dive into the smaller birds the uh the passerines the finches the canaries 
Yeah. So I think you have a nice screen share for us, right? All right, let me go ahead and share my screen so we can get the uh, PowerPoint started here. All right. And just a reminder, if you have a question, uh, put it in the Q&A feature, not the chat. And then uh, try to get some. Right. So um, I wanted to talk about finches because I know we always talk about parrots and parrots are always our like main focus of uh, our Lefebvre's webinars, which is great. Um, but a lot of people who have parrots also have finches or have had finches at some point in their life or canaries at some point in their life. One of these, you know, little guys that sometimes we don't uh, think about as much because they're smaller and maybe sometimes seem to be a little more aloof. Um, and so we often kind of uh, don't hear as much about them, but I am a huge um finch and canary fan um in fact my one of my most favorite birds that i've ever had um was a little male zebra finch who was named leonardo da finci um and i have several pictures in this uh powerpoint that are him and his friends that he's had throughout the years or had throughout the years i don't have him anymore um but he was a great little bird he was hand tame and so it was really fun having a little tiny zebra finch who was had you know just as much personality and um interest as any of our our big parrots have in, in people um i raised him from a little baby because i had walked into a pet store one day to actually pick up some crickets for my leopard gecko and somebody was trying to drop off uh, this little baby finch, two baby finches, there was a nest. The mother was unfortunately deceased. They had owned the mom and didn't have her for very long, didn't realize that she was even laying eggs. They got her, she laid eggs, but she hatched out these couple little babies. Um, and unfortunately, don't know why she passed away, but she passed away. And so this owner had these two little baby zebra finches and she just didn't know like what to do and was worried about them and didn't know how to take care of them. So she was trying to give them to the pet store. And I knew how to hand feed uh, birds. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take them from you. I just happened to encounter her and uh, I, I took the two babies. Unfortunately, one of the babies, like as soon as I got home, just passed away. Like, I don't know how long the mother was passed away for. So they really didn't have any food or water. Um, and one of them just unfortunately didn't make it. But the other little guy um, had a really voracious appetite and just took to hand feeding really well. Um, and I raised him up as my little uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and he was just amazing. So um, I just wanted to talk about finches because I think they're great. And I want to convey how wonderful they are and that, you know, we can care for them really well, just like we do our parrots. And they can get medical care just like our, our parrots do as well. Okay, so what defines a finch as a finch? Well, finches belong to the passerine order. Um, they're these smaller sized birds. They have this conical pointy beak and you can kind of see this picture here. This is Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and you can see his nice little conical beak there that's pointy. Um, so it's not sh shaped like a hook bill like our parrots are. Um, it's rather this little pointy straight thing. Um, the other thing that makes them unique and different from our parents, uh, parents, parrots, <laughs> is that they have what's called anisodactyl feet. So anisodactyl feet means that you have three toes pointing forward and one toe pointing back. Um, and you can kind of see it here in the photo. He's got these three little toes that are pointing forward and you can't see his back toe, but there is only one single toe pointing towards the back. In our parrots, our parrots have two toes pointing forward and two toes pointing back. That's called a zygodactyl foot. Um, there's actually lots of different names for the different like foot shapes of birds, um, but most commonly, Birds are going to be either zygodactyl, like our parrots, or anisodactyl, like our passerines, um, many of the raptors, chickens, a lot of those guys. So that's what makes a finch a finch. All right, so what do, what do finches need compared to cytosine birds? Well, they're actually really kind of similar to cytosine birds. Um, they have a lot of the same just basic needs, right? Everybody needs food, water, shelter, and um, enrichment in their, in their life. Um, they tend to eat a seed and pellet 
diet for the most part, for, for the majority of them. Of course, there's a lot of different species of passerine birds. So this is just a general generalization. Um, there are some unique uh, individuals within the passerine group um, that may eat different things. There are some passerines like our uh, corvids, our, our crows, our jays that are omnivores, but you know they're going to be eating meats. Whereas normally we wouldn't. Oh, there, one of my little finches came out. <laughs> there she is. Um, uh, I I did leave the cage door open. It's okay that she comes out. Like I was saying, they're allowed to fly around, and I just wasn't sure if anyone would come out, but. It looks like that is, um, that's Jerry, and uh, she's just hopping around for us, so we'll see if she flutters around more in the back. Maybe she'll encourage Isis, which is the other one, to come out. Who knows? <laughs> um, so, but anyways, they, they generally eat, the ones that are typically in captivity that we are keeping as pets are going to be like our zebra finches, our society finches, Gouldian finches. Those are probably the most common ones that we'll see in, in our captive bird population um, of the like little finches, once we think of finches, and then of course canaries, which are in the same group. Um, those are the big four that we'll see. But then there are other little ones too that will sometimes pop up. Um, sometimes you'll get uh, people who are really interested in the hobby of having little finches and little passerines as pets. And we'll sometimes see really neat ones like the owl finch. I love owl finches. They're just really cute little birds. Um, if anybody's never seen an owl finch before, I encourage you to look one up, a picture of one up, uh, because they're really quite pretty little birds. Um, and then sometimes there's uh, wax wings. I mean, there's there's tons of different uh, little passerines out there that people will keep as pets. Generally speaking, most of them are going to be seed or pellet um, diets that they're going to take. Now, they will, some of them will also eat a little bit of insects as well. Um, so if you have um, mealworms or crickets or like freeze dried um, crickets or freeze dried mealworms, uh, that can be used for some of them as well. And then some will also eat fruits. Um, but again, it kind of does depend on our, our species that we're talking about. And really the passerine group, there's like about 4,000 different species, a little more than 4,000 different species of passerines. Um, so, or individuals that fall into that passerine family. Uh, so it's quite a broad encompassing group. Um, so it's uh, for me to make these generalizations no, but it does not necessarily fit every single species in that group, um, but it'll uh, work for a lot of them. Uh, they are very social birds. Uh, they really do best when they have a friend for most of our finches. Now, canaries um, are interesting because our canaries, they, they, they're they certainly social. Uh, they like having friends, but the males, one of the reasons that people keep canaries or historically have kept canaries as pets is because canaries can be really beautiful singers. And if anybody's had a canary, um, they know that the males are really quite amazing sometimes with their, with their singing. Um, and they really prefer to sing uh, when they are by themselves. Uh, sometimes when they're with others, they don't sing as well. They may sing a little bit, but they may not really do that big song that they like to, or that they're well known for. Um, and that's just because of, you know, that song is trying to uh, establish territories. It's trying to call for a mate. And sometimes if there's other birds around, then they may not just be as motivated to, to do that singing. So but the vast majority of our little um, passerines do want to have a friend of, of some sort um, to thrive and, and do well. Um, so um, I wanted to, to show you guys, too, uh, when it comes to feeding them um, seeds, uh, it is really important, just like for our parents, you know, we've talked about before in, in nutrition lectures that you don't want to just feed them seeds because uh, the seeds that we typically have in captivity are not necessarily always representative of the diversity of seeds that they have access to in the wild. Uh, when you look at a lot of your just like basic seed mixes, there tends to be around like five to seven different types of seeds in the mix. Um, and 
you know, it's okay for a lot of these little pass rings, but it may not necessarily be complete and they may not really be getting all the other nutrients that they need, such as calcium and vitamin A and certain proteins when they're restricted to these small number of seeds uh, that are in standard um, seed mixes. So therefore, you really need to either get a little bit more variety. There are some newer seed mixes that have been coming out on the market with like more variety of seeds or just like our, our um, citizen birds doing some level of pellets because those pellets are going to be more balanced with the different amino acids, vitamins, and minerals. Um, and so with me, what I what I usually do with my birds is I, I do a combination of seed and pellet. Um, I do like to um, feed the, the nutriberries because those are nice. Um, now, because we're talking about a little Finch, some finches have enough beak strength to go ahead and like break it up, a nutriberry that's formed together. Um, and some don't, you know, our little zebra finches, it can sometimes be a little harder, like a full big nutriberry. Like, so I brought an example of one. Um, this full big one may be a little bit difficult for them to really break it up into, you know, the little pieces that they're going to consume. Um, so it's often just really simple to just take a nutriberry and just simply like crush it between your fingers and get it into all the little pieces that are a little bit more appropriate sized for um, zebra finches. So now I took that nice big nutriberry and turned it into my little crushed seed. This one's actually a um, senior nutriberry. I just, I really like senior nutriberries because I like all the extra stuff that's in them as far as like the glucosamine and milk this and all that sort of stuff and ginger. Um, so I, even though these little guys aren't seniors, um, they're about, uh, one's about three and the other's about two. Although I will say, interestingly enough, both of these little zebra finches, um, I got from the wildlife center where I volunteer and they came in as wildlife. Um, maybe somebody found them outside. Maybe somebody was just dumping a bird they didn't want anymore. I don't know. Um, so I don't know their exact ages. It's, it is truly a guess. So they could potentially be older than what I actually what I know. Um, so, but um, I'll go ahead and just put that in their little food dish there and they can go ahead and hop down and eat it whenever they want. Um, but like I said too, sometimes doing a little bit of insects is nice. Um, the freeze dried insects tend to uh, be easier for us to kind of work with. Um, and then also uh, though you can feed live insects, you know, not everybody wants to do that. Um, and sometimes live insects are good at getting away. Uh, so, you know, freeze dried stuff tends to be, I think, more palatable for a lot of bird owners. Um, so, but um, what about enrichment? So, um, you know, we talk a lot about enrichment in our parrots because we know how smart they are and we know that we need to keep their mind engaged because just sitting in, in our homes in a cage without any enrichment can become extremely boring very quickly. Um, none of us would want to sit around with nothing to do all day. We would get bored. We would have behavior problems. Same thing happens with our, our parrots. Um, and we really shouldn't think too differently about our little passerines because, you know, they too need to have something to do during the day, something to keep their mind going, something that makes life exciting. Um, and so when we're thinking about doing enrichment for our little passerines, um, though there are many toys that are on the market for our uh, that are labeled for parrots or sort of marketed towards parrots, um, some of them can be used for our little passerines. Some of them are a little too big for our passerines. Like some of the foraging toys that are out there, the like plastic foraging toys where they have like a drawer that they like open a drawer and they get some food out of it or the like puzzle feeders. Those may be a little bit too big for our passerines. So instead for them, you know, these guys want to do the same foraging activity as parrots because they would be doing this in the wild if they were out in the wild they would be having to search for their food and they would be you know looking through different things to kind of get their their food source or find their food source and so one thing that I've done is I've gotten hay before like hay that you would get for a rabbit or guinea pig what have you um and I've like sprinkled hay out on like a plate and then put the uh 
pellets and uh, nutri berries or a little seed or whatever food item it is that I'm eating like sprinkled in throughout the hay. So now they have to kind of like push through the hay because again, if they were in the wild, they would be hopping around. A lot of these uh, little pastorines are um, granivores. And so they're actually eating like little seeds from plants and stuff, right? So they'd be hopping around these plants. So them pushing a little bit of uh, hay out of the way to find a little bit of food here and there is totally natural and, and normal. Um, this little uh, thing here is actually something that's created by um, an individual that I know. Um, her name's Carmen and she's in the UK and she makes these great little like foraging plates. So this is like a little bamboo plate and mixed in that bamboo plate or, you know, inside of it, there's like little bits of wheat grass, there's flowers, um, things that are totally edible and safe for parrots. Um, but I've given them to my finches as well because they work great for the finches. And I can put back here, I have a little bit of uh, pellet and seed mix in a food dish, uh, but I sprinkled that inside of here and, and look what they're choosing to do. They could choose to be back over here with the easily accessible pellet and seed, but instead, what are they choosing to do? They're choosing to pick through this thing to find the little bits of food inside of there, um, probably because it's more mentally stimulating. It's more exciting and they have something to do with their day and and foraging is a totally normal behavior that that birds typically like to do. And when given the option to forage or not, a lot of birds choose the option to forage as opposed to not foraging. Um, it's sort of like an intrinsically rewarding behavior. So, so, you know, something as simple as a little bit of hay and putting it on a plate and putting the seeds in there um, or pellets in there that they have to pick through is a great way to get them to engage more with their environment. And that's just one example. You certainly can provide them with other types of toys that, again, are meant for our bigger species, um, you know, little bells, um, little wood toys, uh, paper toys. This little thing here is actually marketed for parrots. Uh, and it's like this little, like, uh, rope sack sort of thing. Uh, but it has a bunch of pieces of like shredded paper, colorful shredded paper in there. And I mean, they love to go over there and they just start peeling like the little pieces of paper out. Again, it's fun. It's exciting. Now, some of this might act maybe a little bit uh, hormonal for them or hormonally stimulating because it's little pieces of paper that they're probably thinking, hey, this is fun. I'm going to take this and build a nest somewhere with it. Um, so that might be something that is the reason they're wanting to play with it, but it is giving them time to interact with their environment and do something more than just sitting on a perch all day. They really should have areas that are safe or where they can feel safe, like areas where they can hide a little bit. Again, these tiny little birds, um, they're very small. Um, they are absolutely afraid of predators. Um, and, you know, humans, even though we may have them as our pets, um, they can be afraid of us. You know, they can feel like we're a predator, especially when we're staring at them with our forward facing eyeballs right on them and being like, oh, you're so cute. To them, they're probably not thinking, oh my God, the person thinks I'm adorable. They're probably thinking like, oh my God, is this person going to eat me? You know? Um, so we have to keep that in mind and providing them with an area to hide uh, behind, under, around in some way is good because it makes them feel a little bit more safe, a little bit more secure in their environment. Um, you know, then they, they will talk with you, they will interact with you, they will be, be able to become uh, interested and engaged with you. Um, but they often, if they have a hiding spot, they're going to feel a lot more comfortable. So and, and let it be less stressed. Um, and um, if they feel scared in any way, they have that ability to get somewhere that they feel is safe. And then when they're feeling better, they can come out and interact with you when they when they feel like it. Another great way to provide enrichment for them um, is having a flight room, if possible. Uh, not everybody has that ability, and I totally, I totally get that. Um, these guys are small, so sometimes they are more convenient for people living in apartments um, or, you know, smaller houses and things that may not be able to have um, larger birds. Um, so they can be really great and accommodating for us because they're so tiny. But allowing them out to fly is nice. I mean, they have wings just like any other bird. Um, and allowing them to stretch those wings and get some exercise, I think, is, is really great. And if you have the ability to have a room where they can fly around in, that's that's awesome. Um, I don't have one currently like but I used to in previous homes where I've lived uh I've had just a bird 
flight room that was like my finches room. They had their cages that they could go to if they felt like it, but the cage door was open all the time. The room was, you know, as bird proofed as one could get a room to be. Um, and it was just their room. Um, and I had like uh, tree stands and like little uh, ropes and vines and things like plastic vines, like hung from the ceiling in various locations um, so that they could fly around and have a lot more space to um, enjoy their day. And of course, just like our um, our past or citizens, we want to have lots of different types of perches for our passerines. You don't want to have just uh, plain wooden dowels. You know, a single wooden dowel is fine, um, but do make sure that you have other things, rope perches, natural perches, um, different things so that there's different textures on their feet so that they are not getting any sort of ulcerations, irritations, or anything like that. All right, so uh, that's sort of just the basics of care. Um, and I wanted to go over some common medical problems because of course I'm a veterinarian, so I like to talk about the medicine of, of anything. Um, so uh, I wanna bring these up because these are common things that I've seen. And you know, there, there may be a little bias in that because these are things that I have seen commonly. And there may be some differences regionally um, wherever you are in the world as to what things may be uh, seen more in one area over another. Um, so keep that in mind, but these are things that, that I've seen with some frequency. And one thing I've had many people say with the little birds is like, oh, they're so tiny. There's nothing that you can do. Why take them to a veterinarian for help? And that makes me a little sad because number one, I love these guys so much. Um, but you know, we don't want them to suffer. We don't want any animals to suffer. And it is true that sometimes we are limited by size. A tiny animal sometimes does limit us in what we can do, but that doesn't mean that we can't do nothing. Uh, there's many times where we are able to do medicines and supportive care um, and things that can get these little guys to pull through problems. And Sometimes there are things that are more serious that are hard for us to resolve, but we can still do sometimes support that makes them feel comfortable for a period of time. So let's go ahead and get into some of those things. All right, so I wanted to talk about infectious diseases first. Um, the first infectious disease I wanted to talk about is called Macrorhabdis ornithogaster. That's the big scientific name, but the name that you'll often hear it called by much more commonly is avian gastric yeast. It's a fungal organism and it's pretty common in our little finches. Now we do see it in other species as well. And this picture that I put up here, um, this are my my birds um, and you can see it's sort of like this mixed flock where this is Gigi this is one of my African greys um, and she's hanging out on a little tree stand with two budgie friends um, Gigi's great with other birds she is really fine with she's not fine with my other African grey but and any species that's not an African gray, uh, she's really quite good with them. And so she would sit when I had my little budgies. I don't have my budgies anymore, but she used to sit on the tree stand with the budgies and, you know, they would just hang out together. But budgies are really well known for avian gastric yeast. They're probably the number one species that we see avian gastric yeast in followed by the finch. And here's my little zebra finch down here. And what you can't tell in this photo, but I know in this photo, is his eyes are actually sort of closed. You can't really tell because of the angle that I have the photo, but his eyes are closed and he's sitting in the sun because this is my little Leonardo da Vinci. He had avian gastric yeast and he was feeling really crummy from it. And so he was choosing to sit in the sun because he was warming up, just trying to feel better that that heat and warmth from the sun you know makes animals feel better you know so he was seeking that out um because he wasn't feeling great from avian gastric yeast the signs that it causes in them when they get this yeast organism it infects the the gastrointestinal tract and sits in a very specific portion of the stomach uh birds have like two parts to their stomach they have the proventriculus and the ventriculus the proventriculus is the like glandular portion of the stomach and it's sort of softer. And then the ventriculus is the more muscular portion of the stomach and it does like the grinding and sort of mixing of food. 
Um, and the avian gastric yeast organism lives like right at the junction between the proventriculus and ventriculus. Um, and when it sits in there, it can cause local irritation inside of the stomach, lead to a lot of inflammation, cause ulcers in the stomach. And if anybody's had an ulcer, you know that they are not comfortable. Um, they can really hurt. And, and one of the problems with ulcers is you can bleed uh, from an ulcer. You know, if you have a big enough ulcer and it's been going on for a period of time, you can have blood loss from that ulcer. And that can absolutely happen happen with our birds. Um, and then because it's all ulcerated and inflamed, they may not be having the normal GI tract functioning that they should be. They may not be absorbing nutrients the way that they should be. And so because they have this uh, inability to absorb nutrients the way that they, they should, they lose weight. But then they have a really voracious appetite. They're trying to, they're just eating all the time. And that's a very common thing that people will say they see is that they will see their birds at the food dish, like hanging out, the, out at the food dish, just constantly sitting there, constantly looking at their food, um, way more than what they used to do. And that's because the bird is hungry. It wants to eat. It's trying to eat. It's actually ingesting things, but nothing's getting absorbed or things are getting absorbed really impaired um, and they just drop weight. They then start to feel really lethargic because, hey, if you're not taking in any nutrition, well, then you're not you know, making energy or anything like that. Um, and so they'll get really just quiet. And then they'll often be fluffed up because that's just a general sign of ill health in a bird. They just fluff up their feathers and kind of sit there all hunkered over if they're not feeling great. So the diagnosis of avian gastric yeast, um, there's a couple ways we can diagnose it. Like if I have a bird that comes in that I'm suspicious could have avian gastric yeast, um, I'll do a gram stain, which is a like I take a poop sample and we do a special stain called a gram stain and we can find that organism on there. Now there are some times where it doesn't pop up on a gram stain. Um, so there's other tests we can do. One's called a fecal direct where I just take the poop and we like look at it uh, with some mixed with some saline underneath the microscope and see if we can find it that way. The test that seems to be the best is a PCR test. So we're like actually looking for the DNA DNA of the organism. It's a pretty sensitive and specific test, um, but it is a little bit more costly because it is a, a DNA test. Um, so we'll often start with the other tests first, and then if we're not finding it, then we may want to do that PCR test as our really like gold standard. This is what we're going to use to rule it in or rule it out. Now, if we find that a bird has avian gastric yeast, um, there are treatments that we can put them on. The best treatment to date that we have figured out is a medication called amphotericin B. Amphotericin B, um, it's an antifungal. The way that the drug is formulated now is it doesn't really get absorbed systemically. It just stays in the GI tract. So it's working sort of locally to kill those organisms. Um, some people like to use a medication called fluconazole. Uh, studies that look at amphotericin B and fluconazole, it really seems like amphotericin B is the best one, but there's some cases where you know, you have a bird that isn't responding to the amphotericin B the way that it should be. And so sometimes we try to do different medications and see if we're going to get better response. So flucon is all one. There's another one called nystatin. Um, nystatin is known to not get rid of the organism, but it can maybe reduce the numbers a little bit and maybe make them feel a little bit more comfortable, but it's not going to clear the organism. So we need other medications to try to clear it. People often also do apple cider vinegar in the water. Apple cider vinegar in the water is just kind of a general supportive care thing. But what it's doing is it's acidifying the water a little bit. And in acidifying the water, when the bird drinks the water, there's a little bit more acidic pH in the GI tract. And the avian gastric yeast organism doesn't really like that. So it makes it a less favorable environment in the GI tract for that avian gastric yeast organism to live. That does help for a couple of other um, types of like bacterial or yeast infections as well. So it's not specific to avian gastric yeast, but it is one of the supportive care things that we can do to make them feel a little bit better. And then the other thing that's really important is a nutritious diet. Again, like I was saying, the way that this particular organism causes problems is it really interferes with, interferes with their ability to absorb nutrition well. And so getting them a diet that is really um, easy to absorb that they don't have to do a lot in the way of like breaking it down um, is going to be better so that we can try to get them the nutrition that they really need. Um, and, you know, uh, I will say in the hospital, one of the things that we do use with some frequency is the Faber's company does make omnivore care. Um, omnivore care is a 
great supplement for birds who are not eating well. Um, and it's really broken down into some very basic elements, um, like it's like glucose solids. And so the body doesn't have to like break down complex carbohydrates. It has this very simple carbohydrate that gets absorbed, you know, um, and the bird's not having to actually process it too much. So that can be kind of beneficial for, for birds who have this particular problem. Um, I'm certainly more interested in birds being on pellets with this particular problem because again just going back to I need something that's a little bit more nutrient um, dense something that they don't really have to break down um, you know seeds can be it, the body has to break those seeds down a little bit more and process things and it's not uncommon to see whole seeds passing in the droppings of these birds and hey if a whole seed's passing through you know you're not really getting the nutrition to that bird from that seed right so they could eat all the seeds that it wants but if it's not passing if it's just passing through and not getting any nutrition from it why bother um so pellets and and our processed diets do seem to be a little bit better for these guys um, I also have used uh, mashed corn and mashed peas for our little finches sometimes uh, because those tend to be a little bit easier to digest um, and get nutrition from. And then one thing we have to consider with this particular disease is that other birds in the flock can get it. This is an infectious disease. This is something that when one bird has it, it is very likely that other birds in the flock, if it's been living in a flock, could potentially have it as well. So sometimes um, we need to test other birds in the flock that, that are around this individual, um, and we need to isolate those that are positive and those that are negative and make sure we treat everybody um, until they get to a negative status before we can safely have them be around each other. Because if you don't, and you just treat the one bird, well, somebody else in the flock has it, but maybe they have a better immune system and maybe their immune system is keeping things in check more. They could just re-inoculate uh, the individual who maybe doesn't have as good of an immune system um, and have your problem just perpetuate itself. Um, we do have to do follow up on these guys because this particular disease, we don't always get rid of it right away. This is something that we hope that we get rid of it in a single course. In a single course, it's a 30 day, 28 to 30 day treatment um, time for treating this organism. So it's not a quick thing to get rid of. And um, yeast organisms, fungal organisms, they don't always resolve really quickly. They can take some time. So sometimes after this 28 to 30 day course, we recheck a poop sample and, and find that it's still there and need to keep going with treatment until we can try to get rid of it. Okay, uh, and other infectious disease that we see is mycoplasma. Now, I didn't have any um, pet uh, citizen or pet passerine bird pictures, so I pulled this particular picture. These are uh, house finches, so this is a wild bird, um, but it looks similar when we see it in our um, pet birds. So I thought, well, okay, I'll just go ahead and use it. Um, but it's a bacterial organism. It's more common in wild birds. Um, and what you'll see is you get this really inflamed eye. So first, this is sort of a more mild case. He's just got a little bit of like goobery mucus that's being produced uh, because infection is there and the body's like trying to clear it. But like as things get worse, that starts to get really red and inflamed. This is the conjunctiva. This is the normal like little pink part um, around the eyelids. Um, and it's just gotten really swollen and inflamed. And then as it progresses, I mean, you can see how it really starts to take over the entire eye. Like up here, you can tell, yeah, it's getting a little swollen, but now it's like extremely swollen all around the eye. Um, and sort of causing, because it's so swollen, it's sort of like making the margins sort of misshaped. Um, so it starts off like a lot of times like an eye, but but um, it then can, there's a little duct that exists between the eye and the nasal passages, the nasal lacrimal duct, and stuff can like work its way down that duct and be in the nasal passages. You can get respiratory signs where they start to have nasal discharge. Um, and then they just, they feel really crummy with this particular organism. And sometimes they can look really mild like this, but they're totally lethargic and not feeling good at all associated with this organism. Um, there is a test to, to test for this organism. Um, it is a PCR test, so kind of like when we were talking about our avian gastric yeast organism. Um, PCR tests are really helpful to isolate specific organisms and say if it 
if that organism is present or not, because PCR testing is looking for the genetic material of whatever infectious disease it is that we are trying to identify. So we could take a swab from the eye uh, when we have all that mucusy stuff, send it off to a lab, and the lab will run a PCR test and tell us, yep, you got mycoplasma, or nope, not mycoplasma, we're okay. Um, when we treat the mycoplasma organism, um, it's usually antibiotics that we are using uh, to try and control this particular infection. It is, again, infectious. Other birds can pick it up from them. And that means that if you have a bird that's positive for it, it is best to isolate that bird from others. If you're starting to see signs of ocular discharge, sneezing, get that bird away from others in the flock, keep it isolated, get it checked out, see if uh, we have this organism and get them treated if we do. Um, it can be deadly. Unfortunately, uh, and avian gastric yeast can be deadly too. You know, um, many infectious diseases have the potential to be quite serious and, and be deadly. Um, so we just have to keep in mind that the sooner we can get these guys checked out and get a diagnosis, the better chance we have of getting them on appropriate medications and, and trying to resolve uh, what's going on. Um, and then I just love this picture. This is, again, Leonardo da Vinci, my finch. He was uh, looking at my uh little beta fish so um there he is again uh again like i said he's kind of prominent throughout all these all these uh pictures um okay what about other bacterial infections um there's tons of different types of bacteria in the world i mean just tons so like when i talk about like mycoplasma mycoplasma is just one of thousands hundreds of thousands of different types of bacteria that are out there. Um, and so we can see quite a variety of other bacterial infections. It's just mycoplasma is kind of like a big one that causes a classical disease, but you can have other organisms like salmonella or E. coli or Klebsiella or Pseudomonas, or, I mean, the list can go on and on and on and on and on about all the different types of organisms that have the potential to be infectious agents and cause problems. Um, in our little finches, I mean, the, wherever the bacteria organism decides to affect, you can have a problem. I just wrote that commonly in our little finches, we'll see gastrointestinal problems from bacterial infections or respiratory problems. Those are just common things, you know, so if a bird comes in with respiratory signs, you know, it's sneezing, nasal discharge, open beak breathing, tail bobbing, um, lots of different bacterial organisms are going to be on my list of, of possible causes for that bird's signs and symptoms. Um, or if it comes in with diarrhea, again, lots of different bacterial organisms are going to be on my list of what could possibly be going on to cause this bird to be not feeling so well. How do we diagnose different bacterial infections? Um, it depends on where the organism is as to um, what sort of test we need to do, but we can do things like gram stains. Again, gram stains are where we take a small sample from somewhere, uh, easy to do on poop samples. So if I do have a bird that comes in with diarrhea, I'm often running a gram stain on them to see if there is any abnormal bacteria or yeast organisms that could be present causing those signs. Um, I can take swabs from oral cavities or nasal discharge um, and do gram stains of those samples as well to look at different bacteria. And I can also do cultures. Cultures allow me to isolate bacteria that's present because when I do a gram stain, um, it's kind of a more broad test and I'm looking at ratios of what's called gram positive or gram negative bacteria. Um, Cause there's two big broad categories of bacteria. They're either gram positive or gram negative. Um, and birds are supposed to have a predominance of gram positive bacteria. And if I look at a sample and I'm seeing more gram negative bacteria than what I'm supposed to see, okay, that's abnormal. And why does the bird have this gram negative infection? I know that I need to get it on some supportive care. And in a perfect world, I would culture it as well to know exactly which organism it is. Because the gram stain doesn't tell me if it's Pseudomonas or if it's Klebsiella. It just tells me, hey, it's, it's the bacteria that's not supposed to be here. You need to treat it. But if I want to find out specifically what it is, then I need to do my culture. Um, of course, when we have these infections, we need to put them on appropriate antibiotics. Again, depending upon where in the body the infection is coming from, there's going to be different antibiotics that may be better for the GI tract versus better for the respiratory tract or the skin, what have you, because um, it depends on 
like different antibiotics actually have different like tissue penetration. Certain antibiotics are better at getting to the skin versus some antibiotics just don't get to the skin well or, or um, you know, whatever other place things may be at. Uh, another thing, I wrote appropriate nut uh, appropriate nutrition because I think nutrition is extremely important no matter what the species is, no matter what the problem is. Um, we have antibiotics to help us treat infections, and they're fabulous. They are great, but we also need to have appropriate nutrition so that these animals can mount an appropriate immune response themselves, because antibiotics alone are not going to be enough to treat a lot of the infections that are out there. The animal needs to have an appropriately functioning immune system to also fight off infections that are present and have those antibiotics be there as support and help, you know. Um, so appropriate nutrition cannot be stressed enough. Um, this little bird, again, Leonardo, uh, he was helping me put groceries away. Uh, he's standing on a thing of Parmesan cheese. I would not recommend Parmesan cheese for any bird. Uh, so inappropriate nutrition picture. <laughs> we need to get him something better. Um, and then, of course, we need to try to determine why the infection happened in the first place uh, so that we can try and prevent reinfection in the future. Um, sometimes we're able to determine that, and, and unfortunately, sometimes it's extremely frustrating and we're not able to determine why an infection happened in the first place. So, um, okay, other things that are common, aside from infectious diseases, trauma. We do see trauma um, in many different species, um, but, you know, these tiny little birds, they have very, very tiny little bones, um, and so if there's some good enough level of force, they can break. Um, we certainly see wing fractures, leg fractures. Again, here's Leonardo helping me put groceries away, and he was just wanting to be involved, and so he had flown down right in the middle of all these groceries. Uh, you know, and that's kind of a dangerous spot for him to be, right? Just hanging out in the middle of the floor, like, what if when I'm picking up this bag of groceries, I, it slips out of my hands and I drop it on him? Like, I could potentially cause a fracture very easily in such a teeny tiny little creature. So um, just always being aware of all the types of issues that could happen out there in the world and dangers for these little guys. Um, one particular type of fracture that I wanted to talk about just for a moment is a coracoid fracture. Now, everybody knows what wings and legs are, right? That's kind of easy for us to say, oh, a wing fracture, a leg fracture. But sometimes you might hear your vet say, hey, your bird has a coracoid fracture. And that makes you go, what is a coracoid? So I have a little anatomy picture over here. Um, and this is just a general bird anatomy photo. And you'll see this, the coracoid. There's this little bone that is present um, in the shoulder girdle because this whole thing is the shoulder. So when we think about our shoulder, our shoulder girdle is composed of the humerus and the actual shoulder um, joint and the shoulder of the scapula. Um, and you can't see the scapula well in this picture because it's kind of hidden behind the humerus. Now, birds have an extra bone in that shoulder girdle, and it is the coracoid. So they have their humerus, they have the scapula, it's again hidden behind the humerus in this image, and then they have the coracoid bone. So this whole section makes up the shoulder girdle. The coracoid bone, what it's doing, it's kind of acting as this extra little strut um, on the body there for flight. Birds' muscles that power their flight are attached to the sternum. So here's the sternal bone. We often call it the keel. It is covered by very thick muscle. That thick muscle is the pectoral muscle mass. There's a superficial and a deep pectoral muscle. Those muscles, their muscle bellies actually come up along the coracoid and go between the bones in that shoulder girdle to attach to the humerus. And the way that those bones attach um, allows for the downstroke and upstroke of the flap, uh, flapping flight. So like when birds contract the uh, like deep pectoral muscle, um, it allows for the downstroke of the wing in the humerus. And when they contract the um, superficial pectoral muscle that allows for the upstroke of the wing. So that bone is really important uh, as those muscles sort of traverse across it and are involved in that um, shoulder girdle for flight. So 
uh, that coracoid bone sometimes gets injured in these little guys or any bird, um, but it often happens when they crash into like a wall or crash into a window or a mirror. You know, they it happens when there's some pretty strong impact sort of head on um, because it's a pretty thick bone right there, but they need to have like pretty high impact coming right at the front of it to hit it and fracture it. Um, and so sometimes we'll have little birds come in where they're having a drooped wing and the owner's concerned that there is a wing fracture, that one of these bones along the wing is fractured. But in fact, it's this bone down here because it's affecting the shoulder girdle um, that the wing ends up drooping. And so we'll take x-rays and go, hey, all these bones look okay. This particular bone can sometimes be hard to see on an x-ray. Um, and we have to do like really specific views to catch it nicely. Um, so, you know, we may be able to do one of those special views and find a coracoid fracture, or we may do standard views and say, hey, everything looks okay. And uh, these longer bones of the wing. So I'm suspicious there's a coracoid fracture. The good news is like 90% of birds with coracoid fractures will heal well uh, with just cage rest. They need pain medication. They need, you know, to be um, relaxing and not uh, doing anything too strenuous, uh, but they can absolutely heal. Other things that we see, unfortunately, when they hit walls, windows, mirrors, um, is back trauma. And, and this is a little finch that I actually brought on uh, one of the webinars, I think maybe about a year ago, I brought her on the webinar. Um, and she had back trauma, don't know exactly where, what she hit. She was one that had gone into the facility where I volunteer. Um, and what she's doing is she's not able to support herself on her hind limbs. So she's kind of resting on her chest. She had movement of her hind limbs and she could lightly grasp, but she could not support herself. And that's because she had a back fracture. Um, treatment for birds with injuries is very much like any other larger bird. It's gonna be anti-inflammatory, some physical therapy, Laser therapy can help too to reduce inflammation, just time, you know, animals need rest and just support. Uh, okay, just a couple more things. So uh, reproductive problems. We've talked about reproductive problems plenty in our uh, uh, citizen birds. Reproductive problems happen in our finches as well, our little passerines. Uh, egg bindings or dystocia or ovostasis, um, kind of different terms for sort of very similar problems where essentially an egg is not moving through. Um, they can have thin shelled eggs. Um, they can have reproductive tract cancers. Um, and really, oh, sorry, I thought I had one more slide on that. Uh, really, the um, way that we deal with these problems is very similar to the way that we deal with the, these problems in our um, uh, citizen birds. So in previous talks where we've talked about, hey, we need to do things like x-rays or blood work or, you know, looking up, looking into why these problems could be going on or, you know, fully identifying uh, what the problem is, we ha have to do the same level of workup with, with these little guys and we treat them very similar. If we have a bird that has thin shelled eggs and we find that they have low calcium or the history fits with a diet that really didn't have good calcium in it, well, then they need some calcium support, you know. They may also need some exposure to UVB light because UVB light allows a bird to make vitamin D. And when they make vitamin D, they absorb calcium more effectively from their gut. Um, so sometimes they need that sort of support. If we have a bird who does have some sort of egg binding, a lot of times we see it associated with calcium deficiency. So they may need some calcium support, but then they also often need like pain medication or they may need some fluids or they may even need to have assistance with getting that egg out of there. Okay, and then cancers. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I have owners uh, in my career as a veterinarian, I've many times had owners say, well, I didn't know that this particular species could get cancer or, or they'll be shocked when, when I say, well, you know, this particular animal has cancer and they go, what? I didn't know. I didn't even think that was possible. Um, you know, and it, cancer unfortunately happens in all different species. I've, I've diagnosed it in a variety of birds, but I mean, I've diagnosed it in various reptiles. I've diagnosed it in fish before, you know? Um, so, so cancer is something that can happen in any 
any species. Um, and it can happen in any tissues, you know. Um, there's many different types of cancers. Um, it's essentially, you know, cells that are replicating on uncontrolled and um you know, that's inappropriate. Um, certain types of cancers that I've seen in finches, um, I have seen oviduct adenocarcinoma, so kind of with our the last thing we were just talking about, reproductive tract pathologies. Um, the oviduct is the, you know, tube that the follicle comes off of the ovary, moves down that oviduct, the tube, to get the different layers of the egg around it and then produce an egg. And I absolutely have seen, unfortunately, cancers in, in the oviduct. In fact, one of my own finches had um, oviduct cancer. And, you know, with her, we did supportive care. I put her on um, some hormone therapy to try and, like, slow the process. And we did some pain control for her. She did eventually pass away from it, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we were able to hopefully give her at least a little bit of support during the time um, from when we recognized it until until her passing. Um, another type of cancer that we see with some frequency in these little guys is proventricular adenocarcinoma. Now, back to the first thing that I talked about as far as diseases go, I talked about avian gastric yeast, and that particular organism, avian gastric yeast, lives at the end of the proventriculus, at the junction of the proventriculus and ventriculus. And again, that's the portion of the stomach, or their stomach is composed of two portions, the proventriculus and ventriculus. And the proventriculus is the glandular portion of that stomach. And sometimes they develop cancers in that particular portion of the stomach. Interestingly, in budgies, it's actually, there's been some association between um, the development of uh, proventricular adenocarcinomas along with avian gastric yeast. So there's some thoughts that like, there's some association there. What is it? Like, is it that all the inflammation and irritation and things that avian gastric yeast is causing allows for like tissue uh, damage destruction and then maybe as cells are trying to replicate normally, maybe there's something that happens that allows them to become this cancerous state. Maybe we don't know. Or or is it that you have cancer that's developing and then avian gastric yeast that was present in low numbers and not really causing too much of a problem took advantage of the situation and overgrow and became more of a problem? Don't know. Uh, that that uh, is still something that people are trying to figure out. Uh, glioblastoma, that's a particular type of brain tumor. I, I have diagnosed that in a finch before. Uh, hemangiosarcomas are a type of like blood tumor, and the squamous cell carcinomas are um, a type of cancer of uh, squamous cells, uh, most commonly found on the skin or mucous membranes. So uh, those types of cancers have all, um, I've personally diagnosed or seen in finches, so um, they are things that are out there. All right, so that's the end of the talk. Um, with just a few minutes that we have left, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Yes. Um, well, this is fascinating. Uh, there's, where'd your, are they still flying around your little area there? Here, they? They're, they put themselves back in. They're like, I don't oh. know if you can see, like one's on right on there on this little like toy. Okay. The yeah. yeah. One's right there. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay. Oh, wait, we do have, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, how, how difficult, or is there a challenge that you face trying to get them back in their, um, their enclosure? Is it, because they kind of have. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I, I have. But for the most part, like, they, since their food's in there, and yeah. like, again, that's sort of their shelter, um, usually go in okay, you know, they, especially at home, I've been very surprised at home, like, because they have a big flight cage that they can fly around in, but then I, I have let them out. Um, and like, when it starts to get dark, um, they will, they go back into that cage, pretty much no problem. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, for my, just for my little budgie guy, I have a, um, like a rod with the curtain rod that's inside the door. So if someone opens the door, there's still a curtain that they, so it's like a, that it's so flying out of the room is a little bit less likely to happen. So that you could have the run of the place. I imagine with finches and canaries, it could be similar. Um, okay. We do have a question. Can finches live happily in an aviary with parakeets? Speaking of parakeets. Yeah. I mean, I've personally had, uh, my finches and my budgies living happily in an aviary before and I mean these two girls they currently live with my green sheet conure now my green sheet conure is blind but before he was blind he actually moved in with them um and it, like I, I initially I would not have suggested anything like that but he like kept flying over to their cage and just like wanted to hang out on their cage all the time was trying to get into their cage and so finally I was just like 
okay, let's see what you do. And, and he would, he would sit there with them and no problems, just hang out with them. So I was like, all right, well, if you guys want to live together, I mean, I guess that's okay. <laughs> and he's uh, behaved that's... himself. They've been living together for probably like eight years at this point. So. Wow. Okay. So that's a question about um, lifespan. So what is the average lifespan of zebra finches? Um, they're surprised that two years old is considered old. So I, I would say um, average is like five to seven. Now, again, both of these girls are newer. So when I say eight years, like it's eight years of different Can finches. Um, the oldest finch I've ever had was eight years old. Um, but I, one of my friends who's a veterinarian, she had a uh, um, uh, orange wax weaver who was 18 which is amazing so okay uh, they'll surprise you sometimes yeah um wow that's amazing do, do, is there a difference between males and females or are certain um types of finches that might have more longevity longevity or anything like that? Sure, there probably is some difference amongst the species, species um yeah. but as far as differences between the sexes not that i'm aware of because of okay yeah um all right, let's see here. Uh, no, well, oh, we are like, bam, we blew right through that. Okay, one last question for you. Okay, so um, uh, Jordan's very, uh, our Autumn's very excited about the, the zebra finch webinar. Um, they have three male brothers with, and the smartest uh, gets picked on, of course, right? The smartest one gets picked on. Uh, would it be better for them to be um, an even number? So there's three, should they have like four? Um, they have a double flight cage with a divider and they feel bad when they have to separate the small guy from his two brothers. <laughs> His two brother Finch friends are, are getting, you know, they're ganging up on him a bit. So what do you, housing, well, how do we house these guys so they're all happy? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that I can comfortably say that there's, they do better in even or odd groups. Um, they might do better with one more mixed in there. Um Gosh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that I could say that for certain. I do feel like a lot of birds are definitely individuals, and um, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe they would do better with one more, so that the little other, the one who's getting picked on, has some sort of friend to to hang out with. Um, but it would absolutely be a trial. All right, all right, yeah. What's going on there, little zebra, those little zebra brains, which are very smart, by the way. <laughs> they do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, um. Uh, studies with the neuro with with, with uh, zebra finches, correct? They do, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of um, studies on uh, their singing. You know how they develop their uh, songs. You know their their mental capabilities of of learning. So they're pretty interesting to to um, learn more about. Nice. Okay. Well then, uh, and that, those are, they're just adorable. And yeah, I, you mentioned earlier, man, if you have a chance to check out the little owl finches, they are, they are, they're quite cute. Just and like the zebra finches are adorable. So are the, the owl finches. I just saw them uh, a couple of weeks ago at the, and uh, they're just, they're, they're adorable. Like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I got to give our, our giveaway today. Um, and that is going to go out to Terry, Terry uh, Caputo, uh, tropical nutriberries. Um, they'll be coming your way and you can also uh, choose another Lefebvre product of your bird's choice. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, and also I think we're going to, we're going to try to sprinkle some, um, some of those booster berries to some of our, our, our chicken, um, chicken people who joined us today. So, um, if we had any, uh, that's the new product. Um, Okay, next Friday. Next Friday, we are going to be on with Dr. Tom Tolley for another episode of Ask the Vet. And um, there you go. That was our first webinar, which was rightly overdue on, on canaries, finches, and other small, uh, cute little passerines. So um, thank you, Dr. Lamb. Appreciate it. All right. And you, uh, you in your little, uh, what, I love your, I love the names of all your, your little feathered family. They're just adorable. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks for joining us, you little <laughs> cuties in the background there. All right, guys, on that note, all the best to you, everybody. Have a great weekend and all the best to your flock. Until next time, bye.